So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thanks, Joe, and all of you at Sustained It for hosting. My name is Jennifer Anderson, and I am the co-founder of Sustrana. Um, and we really appreciate everyone. We're excited to talk about successful ways to develop and implement sustainability programs. So let's get started. Um, first, a little bit about Sistrana. Uh, we are a women-owned certified B Corporation, and we're based outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the east coast of the United States. And we were really uh, originally started our business to help companies to build and implement sustainability programs. And we did this through consulting practices. Uh, it went really well, but soon we realized that there were many, many more companies that needed help with their sustainability, and especially getting strategic about sustainability, than we would be able to help just from a consulting model. And so we, we thought about it a bit and decided that it might be useful to leverage technology in this instance, and we could take a lot of what we had, had learned, had brought together in terms of tools, uh, and information and put this onto a software platform that would really enable companies to uh, access affordable, actionable advice and tools and education so they could really do this on their own. So in 2015, we set this uh, somewhat ambitious goal, I suppose, of enabling 1,000 companies to build strategic sustainability programs by 2020, and we're well on our way to that goal. And if you're interested in learning more about us or about that software, um, we're happy to talk about that. There'll be some contact information at the end of the webinar uh, if you want to get in touch with us. So moving on to the goals for today's webinar, um, it's really important for us in the message that we're trying to get out there in the world and, and today for those of you that are listening on the line, to understand that getting value from sustainability doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be expensive, but it really does require some discipline and focus. So we're going to talk about four areas that tie into that. Uh, the first one is this concept of strategic sustainability and what that is, um, and a related uh, concept is this idea of, of sort of three keys to success in managing sustainability that we have discovered over the course of developing our practice and our software, um, and how the concept of a sustainability management system helps you to address those keys um, for sustainability success, and then how to maintain engagement and forward momentum in your sustainability so I think it's fairly safe to say that sustainability is really growing in importance across a wide range of stakeholders. And it's, it's become a mainstream business practices, especially along, among large enterprises. And this isn't just me as a, a founder of a sustainability-related company talking. This is really supported by independent research. For example, 76% of CEOs believe that embedding sustainability will drive revenue growth and new opportunities. Uh, over the last 20 years here in the U.S., there's been a dramatic 14-fold increase in the amount of assets under management that are, are managed from a sustainable and a responsible way. And so this is really an indication that investors care very much, are beginning to care more and more, and care very much about uh, sustainability factors in the companies they invest in. 82% uh, of millennials consider a company's CSR uh, program or strategy when deciding what job to take. So obviously this is becoming more and more important from an attraction and retention perspective. And 65% of consumers across six different international markets have communicated that they believe that they have a responsibility to purchase products that are good for the environment and good for society. So, so the question really becomes, you know, why is it that people are now paying more attention to this, and in particular, why are companies doing this? And my response to that is really, why does any business do anything? It's an intention to, to help grow the business, to make the business more resilient, um, to make the business more profitable. It all really comes down ultimately to the bottom line in the short, medium, or long term. And, and where sustainability comes into play is, is that you have businesses that are understanding that by looking at their social and environmental impacts, governance factors, and the business model from a sustainability perspective, and that's kind of a lot of the different things that you see in, in these comments around this circle, circular graphic, that this leads to benefits to the company uh, that really improve its longevity and its bottom line. So reduction of risk, 
um, decreased waste and improved efficiency, uh, brand and reputation benefits, uh, advantages over competitors, the ability to attract and retain talent and, and improve productivity, and ultimately kind of the holy grail is innovation, right? Being able to create new products and services for markets um, that you really wouldn't have thought about previously if you weren't thinking about things through a sustainability lens. So let's look at just a couple of examples of, of what I'm talking about. So right now, companies are finding all sorts of creative and innovative ways to reduce water and chemical use. These are two big areas of concern in many industries, particularly in apparel, certainly. And Levi's, for example, is using a couple of strategies um, to reduce uh, process water, uh, 90, eliminate 96% of the water used in their finishing process, but they've also created a care tag for the planet that is sewn into every pair of jeans that people purchase that encourages consumers to adopt care methods that use less energy and less water. So, you know, through these kinds of efforts, they're certainly saving water and, and operationally, but it's also delivering additional layers of benefits around brand and reputation, long-term stability, and customer loyalty. Another example comes from a company that I'm sure uh, all of you or most of you have heard of, and that's Unilever, and oftentimes they're looked at as being a sustainability leader, and you can definitely see that when you go to their website, this image is from their website, and when you click on some of these boxes, you get a, a plethora of information, but they have great case studies, and I encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, a couple of them I've highlighted here talking about um, how they've redesigned shampoo and conditioner bottles that not only save plastic, but are actually actually reduces truckloads, taking 300 trucks off of the road every year by making more efficient packaging so they can fit more into a load. You know, reducing phosphate use in laundry detergent that results in 50% reduced uh, carbon emissions. So those kinds of things, those innovations are things that they wouldn't have necessarily identified if they were not looking at their business through the lens of sustainability. And this particular example here comes from VF Corporation. And it's, it's interesting to see that even in supply chains, companies can demonstrate that tackling tough issues head on can have a really positive impact on the bottom line. So in this case, VF's uh, program, which they call the Third Way Program, incorporates their own company's approach to employee-focused workplaces, so basically recognition uh, and celebration of individual and team achievements, and then they have taken that concept and they've extended it to their supply chain. And the result has been interesting. It's increased both productivity and quality simultaneously. So they're really creating a mutually beneficial long-term relationship with suppliers that increases company stability, customer satisfaction, reduces waste, and reduces risk. So multiple, multiple levels of benefits. So when I talk about some of these examples, um, oftentimes I get comments from mid-sized and smaller companies that say, oh, you know, well, that's great that these big companies can do all these things and they have more resources, they have more capital to invest, they have people, um, you know, they, they just can do more than we can do as a mid-sized or a smaller company. And I, and I want to point out this example, this quote from um, Stella McCartney about her design, clothing design business, because it's an example of uh, a smaller business that, or mid-sized business, if you will, that has achieved the same kind of increase in growth while still reducing impacts. And really, these results are not unique. There are many companies doing this, but they, it does require a thoughtful approach. In other words, really a strategic approach to sustainability. So let's talk for a second about what that means, the difference between a, strategical, a strategic and a tactical approach to sustainability. And one way to help do this is to, to contrast these two concepts, that tactical sustainability is, is really characterized by a very reactive and opportunistic approach to these concepts. And typically, um, it's in response to areas of pressure or ideas that are generated internally, but it's kind of characterized by ad hoc, ad hoc activities that are focused more on a short-term payback or risk management kind of concept. And, and while that's fine, it leaves on the table a lot of these much deeper benefits that you get from a strategic approach to sustainability, where you're really looking at all of the potential areas of work 
and prioritizing those based on the value that they could provide for the organization in the short, medium, or long term, and applying goals and metrics and, and aligning all of that with a business strategy. When you do it that way, it dramatically increases the opportunities for the company and the chance that the sustainability strategy will be uh, have longevity and be successful. So oftentimes companies will start their journey on sustainability with doing some sort of an assessment. I, I would imagine that many of you are familiar with this. Um, you get assessments either from large enterprise customers, maybe from investors, you may be getting RFP questions. But oftentimes, you know, you might even just decide to do an assessment on your own, such as a B-Lab assessment. But this is a point where strategic decision making comes into play most significantly. And it's often overlooked because of our, our human nature and our tendency to be reactive. So while assessments can help us to definitely identify where we're doing well and where we're falling short, there's often more work to be done based on what the results of your assessment are that you can tackle in a short period of time, a 12 or 18 month period. So a lot of times it's not readily apparent where to start or how to prioritize that work that comes out of the assessment and it can feel overwhelming and confusing. So having a strategy or being more strategic about it gets you from the, sort of this feeling of overwhelm to a clear path forward, even if you're only focused on a couple of small things at a time. So we're going to talk about a, a clear six-step process for building an effective sustainability strategy. But before we go there, I think it's, it's helpful to kind of go over these three main points I mentioned for a successful sustainability uh, program. So, so the first key, the first critical success factor, is really to take the time to understand what all of the issues are that you could work on and which ones are going to create value for the company because they're going to reduce risk or create some sort of an opportunity. And step two is to really use the information from that process, that assessment process, to then get the buy-in that you need internally to allocate resources towards the work that you would like to do and, and effectively be able to communicate that all internally. And then the third critical success factor is really in the organization and implementation phase of that work. And that's really laying out a very clear plan with timelines, responsibilities, and accountability that people have access to in a way that makes sense so that the work moves forward and is done in a logical, in a logical fashion. So we're going to dig in, oh, actually, I think this was the point, uh, Joe, where we were going to do a poll. So I'm actually going to back up there for a second and I'm going to click on that. I believe that if I just click on this, um, hopefully everybody's seeing a poll on their screen. No? Hmm. Okay. How about that? Let me try this. Sorry about that. How about now? Great. Okay. So if we can take about 30 seconds to answer the poll. What? Let's try. No? Go back. Okay, Jennifer, okay. if I just take over very quickly yeah. on the polls, let's see how we do. Please. So hopefully now everyone can see that poll and you can. Thank you, Joe. There you go. <laughs> so polling is obviously one of the, the fun things that we're playing with with GoToWebinar, but it should work. So if everyone can vote, we're going to give you about 30 or 40 more seconds um, and then we'll close it off and we'll have a look at some results. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. My pleasure. Joe, are we seeing any results? Because unfortunately I'm not able to see it. Joe, are you there? 
Hi, Jennifer. Sorry, I'm just looking at it. I think, as everyone's, I've, everyone has noted, it is quite difficult to see how to vote. Um, I am. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you. Okay. It seems like the poll, well, maybe. All I can tell you guys, I I can only apologise. It seems like the poll has has closed itself. Um, we aren't able to to vote it. I'm not sure how to reopen the poll for voting. So I think the best thing. Jennifer, as if we just plow on. I'm, I apologize. We'll move on. Okay, no, 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 absolutely not. No problem. Okay, well, we will move on. Um, so we're going to dig into each of these three areas, the, the critical success factors that we talked about a little bit deeper, um, and particularly about this concept of articulating the value of sustainability, which was the whole question that we had put out there, um, but really within the context of putting in place a sustainability management system, which ultimately sounds a lot more scary than it really is. An SMS is, is really just a process that builds a strategic approach to sustainability. So by doing so, it really is intended to reduce any wasted effort among team members. It can alleviate you know, frustration and confusion and ultimately generates better results. And the great thing about it is that it does not require you to spend any money to put it in place. So a sustainability management system is really similar to an EMS, an environmental management system, such as you might have, uh, be aware of, like ISO 14001, and that it follows a plan, do, check, act kind of framework. And what, we, what we've done here at Sistrana is we've really built this concept out a bit further. You can see in this six-step uh, circular graphic to make sure that organizations really get to the three keys that I mentioned on the last slide. So let's take just a deeper look at each one of these steps. The first one begins with this concept of getting traction. So no matter what you need or want to do, you, you will require some sort of buy-in. Specifically and, and most typically, you'll need to get senior leadership level buy-in, but eventually your employees as well need to understand why sustainability matters and how what you're suggesting the company does will create value. And at the end of the day, buy-in is going to be required for a number of stages throughout your sustainability journey. So it's really best to learn how to do this effectively in your organization and based on your particular culture, um, because it's just going to be one of those things that you're going to have to do over and over again. So when you start out, um, you're probably going to need some sort of committee or team to work on pulling together your initial plan. We, we often recommend that this team, this work is done very much by team and by committee. So even to create a team with some level of authority, you're going to need to get buy-in. And really the best way to get buy-in is to build a high-level business case for the organization. Often a business case is, is really a combination of some sort of benchmarking uh, of your organization relative to others and a presentation ultimately that concisely explains to the management team, you know, what are you proposing to do and how it will create value ultimately, how it will decrease risk, increase efficiency or grow revenue or some combination thereof. This is also a really great time to consider quick win projects. Um, finding quick wins is, is very important in the early stages of your sustainability journey. It really helps to build excitement among people in the organization, excitement among your team members. It builds confidence among the leadership. We at Sistrana call this concept to get results while planning because it sort of buys you some time to do some of the more strategic work. But quick wins in particular are projects that either require a low initial investment or have a quick payback. Oftentimes it's better if they're high visibility or high promotability. So to find these kinds of projects, you can start with areas that have come up within the organization based on you know, either pressure from external forces or internal interests. You can take you know, employee or committee suggestions. You can look at reports from other people in the industry. You can look at industry associations. Chances are it's not going to be too terribly difficult for you to find some sort of quick wins um, to, to work into your program. But moving on from there, once you have a team and some buy-in and maybe you've got some quick win projects going, you really want to turn to this concept of building your actual strategy. 
And building a strategy is, in pure and simple, it involves prioritizing the areas of work that you can do based on certain criteria that are important to the company. So for example, I talked earlier about assessments. So if, if raising your score on a particular assessment is your primary driver, you can start with those areas of the assessment that will help you to improve your score the most, assuming you understand the scoring. You can build a business case around one to two aspects of that that you want to engage in maybe in the next 12 to 18 months. So that kind of a business case doesn't necessarily have to be super detailed, assuming that the assessment is important to the management team. But we would argue that just because it will increase your score in an assessment doesn't necessarily lead to lasting buy-in internally in your company for a sustainability program overall. That really needs to be tied to something that the management team understands, such as reducing risk or growing revenue or increasing efficiency. So to do this requires um, assessing these areas of work at the issue level, such as you see listed on this slide, and then really based on how much each of these areas can reduce risks or create opportunities for the company. And you can also factor other things into your assessment, which, is, which are typically important, like feasibility or how something supports business strategic goals. And it's also helpful to look at you know, that, those things in terms of prioritizing work. So the initial list of issues that you choose to evaluate and prioritize can come from your assessments. Um, that's a great place to start because it really tells you what your stakeholders care about at a minimum. And then I'm sure there are other things that will come up as a part of the course of the conversation that you can add as issues as well. Well, once you prioritize the issues, you can pick the ones that you're going to focus on in a particular planning cycle. And you now have a strategy that you can articulate the value of um, and the rationale for people. Uh, the next area is to, to move on is basically to, now that you have these priorities, you want to um, identify what projects you're going to do to address those areas. And that can come from a multitude of different sources, like I described in that quick win slide. And if you have done a good job of getting initial buy-in for your strategy overall, you will pave the way for buy-in for your projects. And that will depend a little bit on your organizational structure and the level of authority that you have, but the same principles apply as they do for organizational buy-in, that you need to be able to tie everything back to the value that it's going to create for the company in the short, medium, or long term. So the primary steps for identifying what go into your plan are to, to pick some projects, identify the costs and benefits of those projects, then use some criteria that's important to you to prioritize that, and then pick the metrics you'll track to measure them. Which leads to uh, the implementation phase. So once you have a set of projects identified, um, you're going to move into building an action plan around those. And it's important to just point out here that sometimes your implementation team is not necessarily going to be the same team that built your strategy. Because once you have a set of projects, you're going to need the individuals to be working on those projects that have the most knowledge and the connection to the work that needs to be done. But at this point, organization is the key factor. You're going to be pulling together this cross-functional, diverse team. A lot of times they're not in the same place or the same business unit. So you need to have a place where this plan lives. Having a committee charter really, really helps with helping them to get buy-in for their work. Um, you need to be able to clearly see tasks and responsibilities and track results, and not just documenting the data from those results, but really the notes and comments about how things have gone, where you've gotten stuck, and then um, you want to continue to communicate regularly with the team members and, and continue to inspire them about this work. That's really, really key. People do this work because they're inspired to make a difference. So you want to tap into that to keep the engagement and the momentum going forward. Um, the next is to report the results. This is something that is obviously critical to get your word out about all of the good work you're doing, post it to your website, um, you know, social media, Facebook, and Twitter. It's also really important to remember to talk about this internally. Report back to your management team and to your employees. Often employees are forgotten. You think they're looking at your website or your sustainability report. They're not. You need to figure out a way to help employees understand all of the things that you're doing and how that's going to make the company a better place. And also to make sure that you really listen and take into consideration the feedback that you get from the communications you put out there, and to be really truthful and transparent about the challenges that you've experienced and what it is 
that you're working to improve um, going forward. Which leads me to the last step of the, of the process, which is improve. And um, this really begins the iteration of your, into your next cycle. So if you're using, for example, a particular assessment tool that like we've been talking about, one way to begin to look at your process, I'm sorry, to look at your progress is to update your assessment. So either way, whether you want to update your assessment or not, you really want to look at how you did relative to the goals you set out. Not just in terms of did you meet them or not, but also in terms of how long did it take, what kind of resources did you spend, um, and just ask yourself questions like how do we do, where do we meet our goals or not, where, what were we challenged with, um, you know, did we need more resources that we, that we thought, and, um, you know, another thing to look at is how have things changed from last year to, to this year, both in terms of the business and the external circumstances. So all of that kind of information will help you as you begin to plan for the, the, the next cycle of work. So lastly, um, you know, just to kind of circle back on a couple of the key points, you will really need to get buy-in early and often. I think I talked about buy-in in about six different places in this presentation. Um, put it in your plan. That is the only way that you're going to remember that you need to continue to reinforce the value of the work that you're doing and demonstrate it to people within the organization. Um, the second key is that a little planning goes a long way. Um, buy time, like I said, with quick win projects and use that time to figure out which issues are the most valuable for the organization and have a really sound um, you know, validation for the work that you're doing. Organize your work really, really well and engage people to be able to see that organizational structure and hold them accountable for the work um, that you need them to do, but also remember to inspire them. And then I think the last point, and, and this is one that I feel really strongly about, is that starting simple is fine. You don't have to have this huge strategy. It's actually better to start simple with a smaller set of projects and to really follow this process and get comfortable with it so that you can uh, iterate over and over again and make it broader and deeper over time. So um, that is really all I have, Joe. I am looking forward to hearing questions afterwards, and I will turn it back over to you for the next portion of our webinar. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So I am now going to take back over the slideshow. And hopefully this will all work a long lot better than the last time we tried it when everything crashed. So everyone should be able to see my slides, everyone should be able to hear me, and we shall carry on. So, as I promised, a little bit more about Sustain and who we are. So Sustain it are, coincidentally, like Sustrana, we're also a women-owned business. We are primarily in the United Kingdom, but we have a truly global reach, as we say there. We we support more than 68,000 users across the globe, um, and in the last 12 months, more than 14 million tons of CO2 were monitored through systems and processes we help put in place and help maintain. So we describe ourselves as a sustainability data consultancy. So we help our clients understand and use the kind of data that the programs that we just heard about from Sistrana and from Jennifer are all about. So we help deliver the information that drives those processes forwards. And today what we're going to talk about specifically is how you can go about making the right kind of choice when it comes to sustainability software. So let's carry on. So today, as I said, we're going to talk a, a little bit, and I don't want to spend too long on this, but I know it's important, uh, on exactly what we mean by software and what we mean by how it helps. We're going to talk about the strategy and planning, so how you begin the process of determining what kind of software you're going to need. We, we'll talk about the requirements, which will be absolutely then about this is the shape of the software, and we're going to give you some top tips, some secrets to a successful implementation. So hopefully by the end you'll have plenty of things to think about and some learning you can take away and apply to your own search for sustainability software. So how does software help? So there's obviously some very key ideas and at the highest level this is certainly what I would say. When you're talking about collecting sustainability software which is as we know an expanding 
suite of data. It started off just being about carbon. It's not longer no longer about that. It's environmental data. It's risk data. It's compliance data. It's supply chain. It's so on and so on and so on. Then having a system in place that gives you the opportunity to distribute the collection of data. So it's not one person get collecting spreadsheets and putting it all into one place. It saves time. It also saves cost, not just in terms of the the resource requirement, which is obviously you know, has a has a cash value to it, but also in terms of, I guess I would describe them the intangible costs. We know that monitoring data and reporting on it has a positive impact in all kinds of ways, in terms of reducing accidents, in terms of increasing compliance, in terms of reducing risks. It reduces the costs to a business. And then lastly, probably the most important one for the perspective of a sustainability consultant like myself, it helps you achieve sustainability goals. If you're able to collect data, if you're able to track against KPIs, then you're able to achieve targets. There are all kinds of quotes about how if you don't me measure something, you can never manage it effectively. I think that's very true. But I also think that if you're not measuring your progress against sustainability goals, then you can't transform how you do business. And that's probably the the goal that I get most excited about. Really, software has to be about adding value. It has to be about moving you forward as a business. I'll talk a little bit about the idea of being a technology magpie later on and what that means. And I certainly am one of those. But for any kind of business decision to be made about the implementation of software, about the choice to have a dedicated CSR or sustainability or EHS software suite, then you have to make sure that it's adding value to your business. And certainly as, you know, as a list of things that it can do, these are all there, but I, and I think they're all worth considering, but it really has to come down to, it has to add value to your business. And I think absolutely software does. I think it's always a good thing to examine as a possibility. And I think that when you're ready as a business to implement software, I think you can get an awful lot of wins in terms of better data, in terms of faster data, in terms of being able to use that data more effectively, and that's not just in reporting, but also in communication, and in terms of you know, managing things like compliance and risk, health and safety incidents, all those kind of things. I think it really can deliver value. So that's software and how it helps. Let's talk a little bit about how you get there. Really, it's going to be about preparation. There's all kinds of you know, things about how you should prepare and how it's vital to success. So the first thing is to make sure you've got support from your leadership. Now, some of the key stakeholders in terms of any software implementation are going to be the guys who are holding the purse strings. The budget has to be there, but also what has to be there is the agreement from leadership that this is going to be something that's used. I have seen over the years several software implementations where there has been no problem at all with the technology, where there's been no problem at all with the will of the CSR and sustainability teams to implement it, but where because there's no support from leadership, the software is, is seen as, well, it's not really important. It's, it's something you should do if you have a chance. If you've got leadership support for your implementation. If the key stakeholders understand and support what you're trying to achieve when you implement software and when you start to gather data in this way, then you will get, I guess, cultural adoption of that system. The users will understand it's important. The people who are in charge of those users will understand it's important. And the data that goes in will, will work. You will be in a position where the system goes live and people understand its value. And that comes from the top down. Um, we've seen it time and time again, it's really important to get your stakeholders, get your leadership on board. You will also need to have a clear business case. <laughs> and I say this realizing that's four words that open up a whole can of worms because creating the business case is not easy. But once you start to dig into numbers, it becomes a lot simpler. Software does have a return on investment. Um, I know that Gartner did some stuff on total cost of, of ownership quite recently for sustainability software, and the numbers are all really positive. So it is, it is there, but 
if you're able to articulate that business case effectively, if you're able to say, this is the value it returns, again, it brings people in. It makes the business case much clearer. It makes the reasoning behind the software much easier to, to see. And it gets people on board with the idea that this isn't just a piece of software that's going to be there and well, we'll just we'll do some numbers into it, but really we don't care. It will be adopted as a part of doing business. And the more you can do that, the better you'll be off. And then probably most important of all, understand what your budget's going to be. You know, I think this, there are certain things that will come out through the planning that will help you define your budget, you know, number of users, the size of the implementation, the scope of the system, how much training is going to be required, all of those things. So have all of that in mind when you start to set your budget. It's not just about buying a blank system out of the box. It's about making that, that sure that that system works for you. And so that's going to be vital. Be very clear about the budget. You will yeah, obviously need that to be clear. Moving on from that, you then need to start to understand what's going on. You need to start to have to put your strategy and your planning into place. So what does that look like? So you need to define your data silos and your workflows. Um, I get some funny looks around the office because I often talk about data as if it's a living, breathing thing or it's a landscape that has that. But really, these analogies work. You will find when you start to look at the data that you want to put into your system, it has peaks, it has troughs, it will have um, areas with of greater data intensity, you will have, find that there are some parts of the business who have been collecting data that you need for years and just have not really shared that effectively. You will find some areas where data doesn't exist in the way you would want it to. You have to understand your data landscape and then you have to begin the process of understanding how you can use the existing workflows to your advantage. If you can find out who provides data, where they provide it to, what systems are in place? Are there contractors that are providing some of this data? Is some of it in spreadsheets that are, that are just sitting there gathering dust? If you understand the, the map of your data, then you can understand what your system is going to need to do. You need Once you understand what the system needs to do, you understand, you're going to have to understand who's going to need to use it. And any system out there is going to have a certain level of structure to it. You'll have administrators, you'll have super or power users of some variety, you'll have data validators, you'll have data suppliers. Understanding who's going to be doing what is going to be key. And this goes back to something that I think is one of the real wins with a software. Having good sustainability software in place gives you the opportunity to ask questions of the people who understand the questions you're asking. If you're asking somebody for data on number of accidents, then if you can ask that directly to a HSE manager who's on site, you're going to get an accurate number. If you're asking that at a regional level from someone who's maybe in an office and doesn't have visibility of the accident sheets or doesn't actually have to fill out any incident forms, you're not going to get that information. Or to be more accurate, you're not going to get an answer from someone who knows if the information is wrong. And I think that's probably one of the more important things. Excuse me a second, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little, as you can hear. We'll plow on. You also need to know this one. Know when you need to go live. I think if you can work from this is the date we need the system to go live by, then you can work it back from there. Um, looking at things like the the NEM report on software implementations, from their research, more than two thirds of softwares, sorry, more than two thirds of companies who went through a software implementation from the point where they said, right, this is the software we're going to use, through to it going live, took a year. 
it takes a year. Um, it can take less, and we've done implementations in less, but that is the you know that is the peak of the bell curve. If you're going to have a timeline, have you know have 12 months in mind because there will always be things that will delay that implementation. There will always be things of things that will send things a little off track. If you have 12 months as an idea in mind, then you can work work from there. Obviously, I would say you know, having a good technical partner in place who can help with project management, having resources available, you can manage that. But more than two thirds of companies who go through sustainability software implementation find it takes them around about a year. There we go. Interesting, by the way, about 13% said it took 19 months or more, so it can take more than a year as well. Now we get into understanding and defining your requirements, being really clear about what you need, and I'll talk a little bit in this section about Magpies. So prioritize your requirements. I think be really, really clear about what you need. When you start to look at the tech, the technical capabilities of softwares, you will find that there are some amazing bits of functionality that you can overlay data onto a Google image or Google Earth image. So you've got live data against yeah. an actual map of the globe. So you can scope your impact. You'll find that it can do integration with with smartphones. You can find it can do integration with smart watches. You'll find that it can automatically update social media feeds. Be really clear about what you need it to do. You will find all kinds of cool, shiny things, and this goes to the magpie thing. Um, you will find all kinds of cool, shiny functionality. Make sure you're looking at what you need, not at what's shiny. Because what you need is the things that's going to be important to your users day after day after day. The things that are shiny are going to be nice when you first talk about them, but after that, they may not actually be quite so useful after all. Be really clear about what you need. Anticipate what's going to go wrong. <laughs> um, talk about your business's idiosyncrasies. Talk about how certain parts of the business do things slightly differently. Talk about how certain parts of the business maybe aren't quite on, as on board as they are. Talk about how your strategy is going to have some challenges along the way. Be really clear about what's going to go wrong. Yeah. Risk registers are, are a part of any kind of detailed project plan. It's important to have that as part of your implementation because you're going to find it's going to be interesting. And research. There are all kinds of ways you can do this. You can go to conferences from the various software houses, and once they find out that you're looking for software, they will invite you to them all. Um, go to conferences where the software houses are attending. Talk to your industry peers. Find out what other options are out there. Or, and I hate this, you know, to, uh, to throw a complete sales pitch in there, talk to a sustainability data consultancy who work with these software houses. But always go back to your requirements. Always go back to what do you need the system to do. And this goes into an, a question. And we're going to try another poll. Uh, <laughs> let's see how we do. So the question we have for you today is what percentage of software functionality is paid for but never used? So I'm going to give you 60 seconds to answer this question. Hopefully you can click on it. I, you know what? I can see that you are clicking on it. This seems to be working. Okay. So what percentage of software functionality is paid for but never used? I'm going to give you five more seconds to vote, guys. And then we're going to go from there. Okay. All right. Time is up. So we'll close the vote. And hopefully, if I click this button again, you can see some results. Okay, we can. So the incredibly boring news is you're right. You're all absolutely right. 50% of software functionality is paid for but never used. Go back to your requirements. Stick with it. Make sure that what you get is what you want. Make sure you're paying for what you use. Okay, so moving on. It's then time to start moving the project forward. You're going to need the support of a team. You're going to need to get the gang together. You're going to need that 
assemble your implementation team, get the key stakeholders involved. I think this is probably one of the most important areas for me, is it's about making sure that you have people who are going to be living with this system at all levels, are there. Make sure that their feedback is, is brought into the project. You know, when you're going to need their, their support to get the system launched effectively, giving them the opportunity to have input is going to be incredibly valuable. Plan for training, plan for communication. If, you're, if this is going to be your first time that you're asking these users to supply data at this scale, make sure they know what's coming around the corner. Talk to them about this is what it's going to look like, this is why it's going to be important, and then give them the training materials to be involved. And then lastly, make the time to be involved. I've seen time after time where companies have gone, okay, we've got, we've made a decision to buy the software, we've got, this is our design spec that we've built, we've bought, yeah, we've signed a contract with the software provider, thank you very much, we'll see you in three months when the software is built. And then they turn around and they walk out the door. It doesn't quite work like that. Have project management resource available. That can be internal within the, within the sustainability team. It can be internal but outside the sustainability team, so having an IT resource. It can be completely external, so working with an implementation partner like Sustainit, and there are others as well. Uh, but make sure that there is that project management resource available to keep the project going, because there will be back and forth, there will be questions, there will be discussions about how it all works make sure that there is somebody available to have that conversation. And <laughs> I put this in as a title knowing full well it's not my strong point. Stick to the rules. Make use of an RFP process. Request for quotes, request for proposals. Once you've started to narrow down who you're looking at in terms of software providers, send out RFP, send out RFQs, get their submissions back get an understanding of what their answers to your challenge look like. It is incredibly valuable. You are suddenly able to compare like for like. You're able to understand how different cost structures work. You're able to understand how the different implementation paths work. You're able to compare and contrast and choose the approach you like the most from the different software houses. Um, this one I think is even more important. I have seen demonstrations of softwares where software providers have said, oh yeah, this is a screenshot of it, this is how it works. Don't do that. See demonstrations of the software. By going back to your requirements, by going back to your list of things you know are going to be problematic for you, and by going back to your RFP, you will be able to guide a demonstration of a software to make sure you see it doing what you needed to do, not what the software house wants you to see. Unless, you know, make sure you see what you want. Make sure you see the functionality you need. Make sure they don't spend the time showing you how it's going to integrate with an Apple Watch. Just make sure it show, you get to see the functionality you need. And I think most important of all, and this goes back to, again, being a magpie, make sure it's the requirements that make the decision. Make sure it's not about, oh, this one's really nice. Make sure it goes back to the requirements and make the decision based on your head, not on your heart. So we don't have another poll question for this, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's been touched on. We've talked about engaging with leadership. We've talked about engaging with teams. We've talked about communicating effectively. The reason why we talk about these things so much is this. Most common cause of, of IT projects failing, 70% of the time, it's user adoption. If you have the stakeholder engagement, if you have the users on board, then you get there. So we are nearly at the end, everybody. Thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us. So what are the secrets? And they're not really secrets, but I think they're important to talk about. Make sure you define what your software, what you want your software to do. Make sure you know your requirements. Make sure you're really clear about them. You're, you're going to be implementing something that's going to be with you for a few years. Make sure you know what your software has to do. As we said, 70% of software implementations fail because users aren't on board. Make sure they trust you, make sure they trust your system, and they will use it much more effectively. Pay for the functionality you need. Don't pay for the things you don't. Don't pay for functionality that you like the look of. If it's not in your requirements spec and it's an added extra, you probably don't need it. Don't pay for it. And make sure that the resource is available 
so that you are able to get the project delivered on time, on budget, and to specification. There we go. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. We've got about five minutes left for questions. Um, so we are going to open it up now. We've got our little question box. I'm going to open that one up. I think we've already got quite a few questions coming in. So let's see how we do. So Jennifer, are you there as well still? I am. Yep, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, so let's have a look through this question list and, and see what we've got. So, quite a few. So, um, so uh, if we go with, I'm going to pick one at random. So we're going to go. With, what software platforms do you recommend to keep all initiatives organised and help with future planning? So I'm going to go with a simple one, really. Um, so, Janelle, my honest answer to that is, it's going to depend on your requirements. I mean, we have relationships with. Um, around 20 different software houses. Um, they vary from everything from enterprise level stuff like Enable on the 360 uh, down, to, down to softwares that are designed around two or three users such as Energy Tech and stuff like that. It's going to be about what you need and once you've got what you need I think or, or once you've defined what you need then you can find the softwares that will work much better for you. Um, yeah, which is a bit of a woolly answer I realize but it's one, I think, it's such a broad question, it's hard to give you a specific answer. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you have an input on that one? Um, no, not necessarily. I think that's a great answer. And I would say that um, our software is a software design for the middle market that does do those things. So if you're interested in looking at how we do it, I'd love to show you. But uh, I agree with Joe that it's really going to be driven very much by your organization, your culture, and uh, what you need. So absolutely. Very quickly follow up because Janelle has just typed a very quick follow up. Janelle, there is a service that we offer which is called Go Marketwise. It's completely free. Um, it's based around the idea of helping you define at a very high level your initial requirements. Uh, if you go to gomarketwise.com, that I think will help you as a starting point with your research. I would give that a try. And whilst I remember to talk about you know, offers and, and free things, I know as well um, that our friends at Sistrana are offering, there you go, that should pop up now, offering a 15-day trial of their tool. Um, when we send out the email that follows up from today, you will get all the details for that, obviously. But that is there, and it's worth looking at. Um, we're going to plow on with questions, because we've only got about two minutes left. Um, so the question I'm going to, I'm going to go with here is, in setting up sustainability, can companies look to other organization-wide communication initiatives like ISO 14001 for inspiration? Um, Simon, the shortest answer I can give you is yes. Um, I think if you look at 14001, there's an awful lot of crossover there with how you know, other parts of sustainability can be brought in. You know, it does absolutely kind of give you a good kickstart, it's worth considering. Um, you can also align you know, other reporting standards. Yes, is the short answer I can give you. Jennifer, I don't know if you've got a, a view on that one. Yeah, I agree with you um, very much. So you're going to be doing things like looking at policy, looking at goals that you've set within your ISO process, and all of those things are going to lend themselves to a broader look at sustainability in multiple different areas. So you can follow that model, and you can use those as a jumping off point to do more. So I couldn't agree more, Joe. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, so I want to go back to some of the questions further up, because I think they might be more in line more you know, kind of aimed at Sistrana. So the one here is, what are the different tools you can use to create a business case, uh, to create the value, to get the buy-in from the stakeholders? Jennifer, I'm going to throw this one straight to you, uh, but I'm going to say yeah. that you, but you can't say just Sistrana. You've got to say something else as well. Just to make I it more promise I was. Actually, I wasn't, I wasn't even going to say Sistrana first, um, although, yes, as you point out, that is one. But, you know, what most organizations do, especially when they're early on in their sustainability strategy, a great thing that I like to point people to are there fantastic books out there, and hopefully you're not rolling your eyes, but there's just so much on this topic. Um, you can look at uh, Andrew Savitz, The Triple Bottom Line. You can look at um, Bill McDonough's Cradle to Cradle. You can look at Ray Anderson 
Corporations, uh, Midcourse Correction towards a Sustainable Enterprise. There's a new one out by Freya Williams called Green Giants that's great. And these will give you some really great background information for building your business case. Um, and also I mentioned earlier that benchmarking piece is really effective. If you look at organizations in your general sphere, your, your competitors as well as strategic partners and understand what they're doing and show people what's happening around the organization, that's a very powerful way um, to begin to build a business case and, and get leadership on board. So those would be my two main things, in addition, of course, to, to taking a look at Sistrana, but there's a lot of other uh, uh, tools out there that can help you do benchmarking um, and, and some business case development as well. No, I agree. And I think, you know, it goes back to that idea that research is really your best friend. You know, there's, as as Jennifer said in some of the slides illustrate, there's a wealth of research out there from all kinds of organizations that talk about the value of sustainability, not just in terms of you know, being a better company in inverted commas, but also in terms of cash value. Now, it does have a positive impact on the hard finances. You know, we see it, Unilever and some of their practices have shown it very well. So that kind of thing really helps as well. Um, Anusha, you also asked about electronic whiteboards. Um, I am a huge fan of whiteboards and I've done an awful lot to surround myself in the office with them. Uh, none of them are electronic just because I like pens. Um, I don't have any view of in terms of what is good good software for whiteboards. Um, I'm afraid I can't help you with that one. I don't know if you have one, Jennifer. Uh, but yes, um, interesting thought. Um, I am very aware that we are over time. So I am now going to wrap it up um, and say thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. Um, I really hope this has been very useful for you. Obviously, we've talked about some interesting subjects in terms of how to set out your strategy, how to get everybody on board, and how to find the software that will work for you. We will, of course, be putting the recording of this webinar up on YouTube, so you'll be able to listen to us over and over again to your heart's content. Um, as well, if you would like a copy of the slides, we will be happy to send them to you in PDF format. Please get in touch with myself or my colleagues here at Sustain It, and we will forward those to you. As I said, you're also going to get an email from Go from our go-to webinar, just giving you some information about the free offer from Sistrana. I think it's a great offer to have. I think it's really worth doing. Thank you very much again for your time. Have a lovely day, have a lovely evening, and have a lovely holiday period as well as we're heading into that time of year. I'm sure we will talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.